Earth has seen a lot in its long history. To date, Earth has been through four geologic eons, all very different from each other. The first was the unbelievable Hadean Eon, beginning with the formation of the planet, about 4.54 billion years ago. Early on, this eon saw the impact of Thea in the formation of the moon, which was followed by a very bizarre period. The Earth and Moon were much closer during this period. Today, the Moon is about 238,000 miles away, but during this period, it was as close as 15,000 miles, meaning that it would have appeared on the order of 15 times larger in the night sky than it does today. Early on, the surfaces of both Earth and the Moon were molten, but would have been interacting gravitationally as normal. Imagine a very close, dull red glowing Moon in the sky. But closer distance means greater tidal forces, meaning gigantic lava tides were sweeping across the Earth, and the tidal locking of the Moon happened very early on. Over time, the surfaces cooled and solidified. The Hadean continued on to the late heavy bombardment, which gave way to the Archean Eon, going from about 4 billion years to 2.5 billion years ago, with the late heavy bombardment persisting in the very beginning of it. By the Archean Eon, Earth had acquired its water, and was actually mostly a water world during this period due to deeper oceans. Earth's atmosphere had no oxygen yet, and was rich in methane. This era also saw the advent of life, so far as we know. About in the middle, however, photosynthesis began, which in turn started the process of oxygenating the atmosphere, but it was being captured in iron reactions so did not persist. It's worth noting here that this planet would have looked very different than it does now. Pale blue dot, it was not. And with all of this rusting going on, the oceans are thought to have been red, with significantly less land above water. And would have been a bit less well lit than it is now. The Archean sun was only about 70-80% to 80 as luminous as it is today. The Archean Eon ended about the time of the Huronian glaciation beginning where at least three ice ages seem to have occurred. The next was the Proterozoic Eon, ranging from 2.5 billion years ago to 538 million years ago. During this period, about 1.8 billion years ago with the end of the iron sink, the slow accumulation of oxygen began in the atmosphere as the ocean released its oxygen, a process still ongoing to a degree though today only a small portion of the atmospheric oxygen we breathe is from the ocean, because most of it gets consumed by modern marine life before it ever gets to us. In this eon, oxygen levels were growing, but only ever reached about 10% at its height. Other hallmarks were the appearance of the eukaryotes, more glaciations, possibly to the point of Earth nearly freezing over entirely, though that hypothesis is losing steam as new evidence comes to light and eventually multicellular life, like the sponges appear, and also the very first really good fossil evidence for life. All the while, the oxygen increased in a trend, but likely saw significant variability. The current eon is the fourth, the Phanerozoic. It began about 538 million years ago and continues to today. This is the age when abundant plant life and animal life spread across the Earth, starting with the Cambrian period which itself began with a huge explosion of new species and evolution, and eventually led to the world we have today. This age saw the rise of our modern oxygenated atmosphere, but that oxygen actually varied a surprising amount, sometimes in a very strange way. And one of the weirdest periods was the age of the dinosaurs, and it got so bad it may have contributed to their extinction. The age of the dinosaurs spans three subdivided periods of the Mesozoic era of the Phanerozoic Eon. The first was the Triassic, which commenced in the aftermath of the Permian-Triassic extinction event, which was the worst extinction event in Earth's history, the precise cause of which is somewhat uncertain, though very likely was due to massive volcanism from the Siberian traps. The Triassic was a very hot period, and the continents were still together as the supercontinent Pangaea. Most of the supercontinent's interior was desert, and the general trend of oxygen levels at the time was low, only about 15%, as opposed to the 21% of today. The levels had been significantly higher previous to this period, reaching 35% during the Carboniferous period. If you were to go back to the Triassic, however, 
In addition to sweltering temperatures and an Earth with no polar caps, assuming the atmospheric pressure at sea level is the same, you wouldn't comfortably be able to breathe this for long. You'd probably develop a headache very rapidly and experience symptoms of hypoxia. But the life living on Earth, breathing oxygen at the time, tolerated it. As an aside, oddly, pressure is very important here. If you could magically change the atmosphere of Mars to be 100% oxygen, you'd still very rapidly suffocate if you tried to breathe it. The reason is that the atmospheric pressure of Mars makes the air far beyond thin. The summit of Mount Everest looks comfortable compared to Mars. But back to the Triassic. The dinosaurs appeared late in this period, but were not yet dominant. And then came another extinction event. The Triassic-Jurassic extinction event was another of the great extinction events, and also not well understood, but the consensus of late has been coalescing around it having been another volcanically related event, though there may have been an impact involved. Some species of the early dinosaurs survived it, and the new period, the Jurassic, allowed for the rise of the dinosaurs. Though while the Jurassic is arguably the age most associated with the dinosaurs thanks to Jurassic Park, both their peak and their decline and extinction actually happened in the period after, more on that in a bit. But perhaps Cretaceous Park would not have had the same ring to it. Oxygen during the Jurassic was similar to the Triassic, averaging about 15%, though at times was even lower. At the beginning of this period, Pangaea was breaking up, rifting into two land masses. It was warm, and there were still no ice caps. The first birds appeared during this age diverging out of the theropod dinosaurs, though the skies were still dominated by the pterosaurs. The early mammals were diversifying, and so were the land plants. Strangely though, this period did not end with an extinction event. It's actually still somewhat undefined just when the Jurassic period ended, and the last period, the Cretaceous, began. The Cretaceous period is where oxygen on this world gets weird. The Cretaceous period lasted from about 145 million years ago to 66 million years ago. It's actually the longest of the three periods. The climate was relatively warm, but the first half was significantly cooler than usual for the Mesozoic, and there were periods of glaciation at the poles. And this was the age when the oxygen dramatically rose. Early in the Cretaceous, oxygen was still at 15%, thought to be because of extensive burning of vegetation keeping the levels down. But something happened that caused the levels to rise dramatically, which may have been the advent of flowering plants on land. It gradually rose until reaching somewhere around 30%, sometimes very rapidly, over just a few million years, and then began to decline. It showed a brief recovery, then declined again to somewhere around the present level of 21%. This rise is thought to have favored the dinosaurs and allowed them to become more diverse, larger, inhabit more land, and reach their peak. As an aside, higher oxygen levels have an interesting feature, recently fleshed out by Lisa Kaltenegger and colleagues. There will be an Event Horizon interview with her soon discussing it. The more oxygen there is in the atmosphere, the more visible Earth is to aliens as far as life goes. Oxygen along with methane are the hallmark of life on Earth from an astrobiology standpoint. These gases go away if they aren't replenished, and that dual disequilibrium would give any aliens looking our way a strong clue that there is a biosphere here. With more oxygen comes easier detectability, so during periods like the Cretaceous or Carboniferous, Earth's biosphere would have been more easily visible than it is now. If we ever see an exoplanet with those levels of oxygen, given that the higher oxygen levels of the Cretaceous seems to have favored the large dinosaurs, one could wonder if there is some analog of a dinosaur on that world, though you could never be sure without going there. But back to the dinosaurs. The question is, what happened when Earth lost all of that oxygen? In the late Cretaceous, during the decline, there is something conspicuous. Long before the asteroid hit that finished them off other than the birds, the dinosaurs were already in a significant decline. They were on their way out regardless. It is thought that a general cooling trend in the geology of continental drift allowed for the formation of polar caps and glaciers, which caused a drop in sea level, a very significant one. The exposure of fresh seafloor to the air acted as an oxygen sink and removed large amounts of atmospheric oxygen. 
This explains the drop in oxygen levels in the late Cretaceous, and it happened very quickly, over the final 10 million years. At the same time, the dinosaurs shrunk from 35 genera to just 12. Possibly because they simply couldn't handle the lower oxygen levels, because they hadn't evolved in that environment. In the end, however, it wasn't the drop in oxygen that finished the dinosaurs off. It was more likely that the asteroid impact delivered their death blow. And had that not happened, they still might have evolved and adapted to a lower oxygen environment. The birds certainly did that. And birds today can fly and breathe in very thin, high altitude air without problems. But had the drop in oxygen been worse, add in some other sink or factor, and there would have been a point where a true mass extinction would have occurred. Had it been so bad as to take out the early mammals, we would never have been here. Maybe severe oxygen drops are common in the universe, and if oxygen is required for intelligence, then Earth simply got lucky. And maybe that alone might be a viable solution to the Fermi Paradox. Thanks for listening. I am futurist and science fiction author John Michael Godier, currently eyeing the dinosaurs suspiciously. You'd think that high oxygen wouldn't have just benefited them in body size, but also brain size. It didn't. But at the same time, we know at least some of the dinosaurs were intelligent, as are some of the birds, even without large brains. Very puzzling. And be sure to check out my books at your favorite online book retailer and subscribe to my channels for regular in-depth explorations into the interesting, weird, and unknown aspects of this amazing universe in which we live.